to the identification of media. So um, if you are media, if you can identify yourselves at this time. Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Uh, good evening, Victoria. And Donna from the Turtle Times. Sorry, is that Donna? Yep. Okay, welcome, Donna. Thanks. And I see we are streaming live on Facebook. So I'd like to welcome the community that uh, is joining us uh, this evening. Um, welcome everyone. And um, turning our attention to the agenda. So we have an agenda in front of us. Uh, looking for a mover seconder, and then we'll open it up for questions and additions. So have moved by Audrey Paulus Bombery, second by Michelle Bombery. Um, looking, is there any additions um, to the agenda? Amendments, I see Michelle. Um, can I add Bell to Correct. our agenda? Okay, so Bell has been added. Is there any other items? Going once, going twice. Okay, so I'm going to the vote. All in favor with the addition of Bell. Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, motions passed. Okay, going to our first uh, item number four, delegations and presentation. The integrated drug strategy coordinator uh, is Eve. She is here and uh, we'll be getting a presentation this evening on the drug strategy. So Eve, we do have uh, share screen capabilities. Um, ask that uh, you utilize that if there is a presentation. And um, yeah, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I will be sharing my screen promptly and um, we got it. Perfect. And you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief and Council, for having me here tonight. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to provide a brief presentation to on the drug strategy. Uh, my name is Eve Kahama, Drug Strategy Coordinator, and I work in Health Administration. I'm also joined by some of my drug strategy committee members, such as mental health and addictions, crisis, home and community care, public health, uh, and others. And what we will be going over today, the agenda tonight will include information on the Six Nations drug strategy, including its mission, vision, guiding principles, our overarching goals, then we'll go into a brief explanation of the Six Nations Opioid Response Plan and current initiatives. Can I just stop you real quick? Sorry to interrupt, but can you quickly also introduce your team? And I know we all know each other, but uh, just for the benefit of um, the online as well, just to quickly introduce your team that's with you today. Yeah, of course. So I'm actually joined by um, my team includes very many members, but today we have specifically Anita Horvat from uh, David Skye from Six Nations Paramedics, uh, Shirlene Bombery from Native Horizons, Lori Davis Hill from Six Nations Health Services, uh, Brody Thomas from Mental Health and Addictions, uh, Natasha Samunti, who's the Mental Wellness Six Nations Coordinator at Health Administration, Lacey Van Every from Public Health, Sarah also at um, Six Nations Health Services, and as well, Lori Montour from Home and Community Care, and I believe Natasha Slezak from Crisis Response, and as well, Crystal Burning from Health Administration. Okay. So what is the Six Nations Drug Strategy? Well, we are a local drug strategy that aims to reduce the harms associated with substance use. So that includes raising awareness, reducing stigma, and advocating for the Six Nations community and its memberships. So this, sub, this is a substance use strategy, which means that it encompasses all substances, including alcohol. However, we are currently focusing on an opioid strategy due to the pandemic and the increasingly toxic drugs that have been found in and around the community, including Brantford. So our mission is to minimize the harms related to substance use by supporting community members through their healing journey. And our vision is a supportive community that promotes healthy, resilient approaches to substance use. 
And the following principles are action-oriented statements that reflect the fundamental values that will guide the Six Nations Integrated Drug Strategy. So that includes collaboration. So by breaking down the silos, we are borrowing from each other's minds, drawing from each other's strengths, which will help reduce the duplication of services and provide wraparound supports for those who use substances. One mind being that we don't all have to think the same way, but we collectively have to have the same goal. And compassion being an action-oriented statement by always asking how we can help our community members and families that are struggling with substance use in a respectful and non-judgmental way so that we can always be meeting people where they're at. Accountability, being accountable for and with each other in our actions and making sure that if we have a plan, we will follow through with those plans. And a good mind meaning that we need to be aware that our thoughts and actions and intent are coming from the right place, as this allows us to make good and clear decisions. So our overarching goal is based out of consultation from drug strategy committee members and the community plan. In the community plan, it is stated that the goal is to build our people free from substance use. And to fulfill this vision, we will actively work to increase collaboration amongst service providers. So just like one of the guiding principles that we have, there are a lot of people who are doing the same things and providing similar services. And our goal is to draw strength from each service provider to collaborate and share resources so that we can provide those wraparound services for our clients as well to decrease stigma so that people who use substances can be able to seek help. In the community plan, it was mentioned that one of the key challenges was stigma, such as pregnant mothers feeling that they can't be able to use services. So the drug strategy is actively working to decrease stigma within community and service providers so that community members can feel like they can use our services regardless of where they are in their healing journey and as well increasing community safety. So this can be interpreted in a couple of ways. It is both increasing individual safety, such as preventing fatal overdoses, and also with community safety by working with outreach workers to reduce drug paraphernalia found in and around parks and schools, as well as working with police to reduce crime. So these are some of the members of the drug strategy. This is not an exhaustive list and I am always looking for new members to join the group. We are currently putting policies and procedures in place so that we can have community members and people with lived or living experience be part of our drug strategy on an advisory level. So there are currently 21 different drug strategies in municipalities across Ontario that are in operation and they're framed by a four pillar model. The four pillar model being prevention and education, which are strategies that help prevent or delay the use of substances. And this could look like educating youth about the dangers of fentanyl or working with the housing department to develop harm reduction approaches in their substance use. As well, treatment and recovery refers to the interventions and strategies that focus on the health and well being of people who use substances or have used substances. So, this could include something like looking for funding to build a residential treatment center so that people can have a safe place to detox and receive help for their substance use. When talking about harm reduction, we're talking about it is a way of being that helps people reduce the risks associated with substance use for themselves their families and communities. And harm reduction understands that many people coping with addiction may not be in a position to remain abstinent from their substance of choice. And community safety recognizes the need for peace and public order and safety. So this works to reduce crime and community harms associated with substance use while protecting the vulnerable. And this would look like working with police to have ride programs on long weekends to decrease the rates of impaired driving. So the work of these pillars aren't distinct and isolated, but much of this work should overlap. So that means balance must exist across all of these pillars in regards to resource flow and strategic initiatives. However, we do recognize and understand that the four pillar model is very much a Western framework. So to make it more appropriate for our community, I've been working with some of our staff with Engelwaria de Genha land-based healing Center to develop this four-fire model. 
So in this model, the four fires are distinct, but work together towards a common goal. And each of the fires have to work together to stay lit. And each of them have certain things to do within the longhouse to keep the fires going. In order to build our people free from substance use, we all have to equally put in the work. And the four fire model also recognizes the importance that culture has and will always have regarding substance use in our community. So this brings about the Six Nations Opioid Response Plan. So this plan did come about due to the increasing overdoses that we've had in the community. And due to the pandemic and the increasingly toxic drugs that are circulating in Brantford and the community, we realized that we needed a plan to be made in order to combat the overdose crisis. So the main goal of the Six Nations Opioid Response Plan is to prevent overdose deaths by using different strategies that all work in the same uh, or work at the same time, including uh, enhancing outreach and harm reduction services, reducing stigma and educating on substance use, helping people access the right services at the right time, and engaging community members to develop action-oriented solutions. So just a little bit more about this opioid response plan. Um, when we talk about enhancing harm reduction and outreach services, we're talking about increasing the availability of harm reduction services throughout the community. And harm reduction is important because it's not about pe making people choose abstinence. It is about ensuring life and life promotion without judgment. So it does come from a strengths-based lens that allows people to make the change that they want when they are ready to make the change and keeping people alive until they're ready to seek help. So that would include things like naloxone and overdose prevention training. As well, when we talk about reducing stigma and educating the community on substance use, we want to make clear and consistent communication on stigma and how that affects people who use substances, as well as we want to educate on overdose prevention, the risks of drug use and the toxic drug supply, as well as where to get help. And ensuring that people have access to the right services at the right time, we want to gather client stories and experiences to make sure that they have access to treatment services at the right time. And engaging community members in action-oriented solutions, we understand that long-term recommendations are needed to address the overdose crisis, which must be informed by community and appropriate engagement with youth elders and people with lived and living experiences. We hope to have a community forum take place during National Addictions Awareness Week, which is the last week of November. So some of the current initiatives that have been happening within and around the drug strategy are with mental health and addictions. So throughout the pandemic, mental health and addictions has been maintaining over 400 clients and working very hard and diligently to provide support for community members. As well, in order to address the wait list, they've been increased, they will be increasing hours so that they can be able to provide better counseling supports. And they're also in, currently in the process of hiring more mental health workers. As well, Ngawadi Adigenha Land-Based Healing Center is open, it means programs and services are running and community members can either be referred through mental health and addiction or they can do a self-referral. And in terms of providing wraparound supports, the Gandao Crisis Response Team, Mental Health and Addiction, and Ngawadi Adigenha are working really hard to establish a 24-hour crisis hub where community members can seek help. As well, we're also in the process of establishing a mobile crisis response team. So this is a program that will have staff partner up with Six Nations Police by providing crisis interventions to people in crisis as well as their families and caregivers. So this not only includes mental health and addictions crises, but also they could be responding to people who've been in car accidents or house fires. As well, the Six Nations Health Bus has become fully operational as of late August. And we've done several naloxone pop-ups where we've trained and given away anywhere between eight to 20 kit, naloxone kits. The AIDS Network Outreach Van comes around twice a week and services about three clients per visit where they hand out naloxone kits, harm reduction supplies, and they help connect community members to services in and around the community. And as well, a program that complements the health bus is the Overdose Prevention and Response Program, where we'll be teaching community 
members and service providers not only how to recognize and respond to opioid overdoses, but also how to respond to stimulant and alcohol overdoses as well. And the Family Outreach Support Group was a group created out of the drug strategy, as we understand that there's a lot of people who want to know and understand how to support their loved ones who are using substances. So we're currently meeting on a monthly basis in order to create resources and workshops on how to support loved ones who are using substances. And the cannabis education team is currently doing a six weeks educational series so that people can make safe and informed decisions regarding cannabis. And lastly, we also have a computer bank in place where people can go and access the internet. Uh, we're currently waiting on hydro so that we can be able to make that final connection. And um, that's about it for my presentation and I would now open the floor to any questions you may have. Thank you so much for letting me provide the space to present. Well, thank you for your work and presentation and also everyone that's on this call for your contributions to this important work. Um, definitely comprehensive um, presentation. I am going to go to open the floor to questions. Uh, I see some hands going up, so I'm going to go to Sherry Lynn first and then Michelle. Um, yeah, just, um, just a question regarding uh, what you said you wanted to hire more mental health workers. Uh, is it possible to hire more psychiatrists or at least another psychiatrist? So it's not such a, a long waiting list for, for our community members? Can respond to that, Eve. Um, I was on a call, Sherry Lynn, with um, today with uh, McMaster and with St. Joe's, and they are even having difficulties recruiting psychiatrists. Um, so, there is certainly a work uh, worker shortage across Canada that a lot of people are experiencing in all levels of employment. Um, so psychiatry is certainly something that is also um, very difficult to recruit. Thanks for that, Sherry Lynn and Christy. Sherry Lynn, subsequent. Yeah, okay. So yes, I know there's that, but is there a plan if there does become a psychiatrist available? There is, um, we do have a um, community member that is part of, and part of our um, group that we're working with McMaster. Um, and I know that she may have certainly have some interest and we have been um, talking to her previously about her interest in coming to Six Nations, but she does have a lot of work right now in Hamilton. And we, we're, we will always be looking to add additional people as opportunities present themselves. Okay, thanks for that, Crystal. I'm gonna to go to Michelle. Okay, thanks, Nathan. Um, so it's really nice to see that all the programs are trying to work together. I think that's been a goal of, of many managers and directors for a number of years. And so I also want to say it's really um, progressive to hear that we will have mental health workers working with police. And I would hope they're doing that as a preventative measure, not so much uh, you know, after the fact, because I think a lot of what we see in our community is interge inter intergenerational trauma. Um, and so we need to have those programs and, and you're all facilitating programs, um, but we need to do it in a coordinated effort. So again, Lori, you and I've chatted about the bus many times before. So tell me about how are we approaching people? Are we waiting for people to come to us or are we actually out there with the bus, you know, at events, riding around Friday night, Saturday night? Like, can you elaborate more on that? So the bus is the bus is here. It, it actually uh, exists now. So it's a matter of, um, like you said, socializing it, um, getting people to be aware of it. Um, Brody is. Uh, um, it was one of his brainchilds, uh, and so I will turn it over to him to give you share some ideas about how he wants to do this or how he sees this um, from a mental health and addictions. But I also want to say that. It's not just, um, it's for every everything under health. 
um, you know, so that so that any of our programs and services who need to have that kind of outreach um, component can have access to it, and even beyond health, you know, once we get once we get rolling. So, I'll turn it over to Brody. Thanks, Laurie. Um, now that the bus is here and it looks so nice, I actually don't want to drive it around because I don't want to get any stone chips or anything. So, no, we're just going to leave it parked for now. I'm just kidding. Um, so it's been out and about as much as we can right now. Um, one of the delays is they have to do like a specialized training and because of COVID it's on Zoom to uh, operate like the wheelchair ramp and the um, lift system. There's a bunch of components on inside that RV. And right now I'm the only one that has taken the, the training. So right now I'm the only driver, um, which is kind of delaying a little bit of things. Um, I mean, the initial, the initial uh, thought for ordering it was like Michelle said, um, it's definitely an old school mentality to think um, people are gonna come to us. We always talk about taking that big step, how hard it is to come through the doors and we can't wait for people to, to take that big step. So it's more um, meeting people where they're at. That's why it was designed. Um, for those counselors that haven't seen it, there is like a sitting area, counseling area in the back. Um, that's a private area. Um, we plan on, yeah, going to ball tournaments, lacrosse games, the fair, you know, um, we didn't get it out at bread and cheese this year, all the, the bigger community events, as well as just doing like pop-up events in random areas, trying to, to go, you know, down first line, down, um, six line. We've, we've kind of traveled around so far to try to see like what spots, um, get the most people right now, of course, it's in the village, um, where we get like the most response. And we're just, um, I guess, like Lori said, there's, it's not just a mental health and addictions um, bus, it's health services bus. So one day it could be the diabetes program out doing a presentation, um, could be child and youth health, it could be us. Um, it's just whoever wants to use it for their presentations and outreach. So it's definitely, um, it's gonna be well used. And um, I don't know if who, we had the picture up earlier, we put the vinyl wrap on, Chikasa did that and try to make it stand out um, so that community members know it's a safe vehicle to approach and just kind of get them wondering, oh, what are they doing today? What are they giving out today? Let's go check it out. Thanks for that, Brody. And I see Michelle has subsequent. Thanks. Thanks for that, Brody. And I would just say, I think um, with everybody working together, I'm sure there's a plan in place and you know the actual trends where you're needed, right? It's beyond community events where we really need to outreach to those who need that support. So I think uh, that's probably part of the strategy and that's what I was um, hoping to hear. So I think um, we'll get there. And I just wanted to add, I, I don't, I think we need to, I really like that we're working together and I would say it's beyond, as Lori said, a health, it's just beyond health. It's a community bus, right? In the end, we're all one community. So this bus should be utilized for um, everybody, all services. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks, Brody, for those comments. Um, just continuing on, I have um, Wendy and then Audrey. So Wendy, you have the floor. Thanks, Nathan, and, and thanks for the, uh, the report. I know this came from Human Services, so I'm not sure if it was just for an update or if there was something specific that the committee wanted, but certainly compliment the coordinated efforts that are going on. Um, great to see. But in the report, in the deck, you talked about the results of the pandemic and those drivers. I'm just wondering what you have in terms of the statistics. I mean, trends generally tell us that mental health is on the rise. It's usually issues impacted by COVID and what's going on last couple of years you know so what is that breakdown what are those stats that are driving some of this work why we're looking at the treatment aspect versus the prevention do we have ratio in terms of what we're doing preventative versus that treatment past addiction um, all of those things that help us to paint that picture you know in terms of mental health in our department itself do we have contracts? Do we have full-time staff? What's the ratio? Do we have the complement that we need to deal with the st statistics and the trends that you're seeing? Do we have competitive salaries? 
Um, are we recognizing our, our staff and supporting them in their own wellness as they take on this, this, these large issues in, in mental health? And the reason that I'm asking all of these questions because I didn't see that in the presentation is what are you looking at from us? Because this is a political table. So what is that political support or that advocacy that you're seeking? driven by those statistics, driven by those numbers that we need to see in here. Thanks for that, Wendy. And um, Eve, do you wanna go first? Um, I guess I, I just wanted to give you the information of what we're seeing and as well to for, for advice and, and to see if the direction that we're going is the right direction or what other things we need to do in order to um, provide a community drug strategy because it is supposed to be led by the community. Um, in terms of, I can only speak to the data and trends in terms of overdoses. Uh, so um, Sarah and I, who's the epidemiologist, as you know, have been doing a lot of collecting of data on overdoses. And I will let Sarah speak more to that. Um, and we've been noticing certain trends that has let, that have led us to going into doing certain types of outreaches like the ones that Brody and I do when we utilize the bus to do naloxone outreach. Um, so Sarah, I'll let you go more into that. Sure, thanks Eve. And I can give a little bit of update on the surveillance aspect that we're doing for the overdoses. So working with the paramedics and police, um, whenever an overdose occurs in the community, uh, paramedics will, uh, their software reports that to us and we compile it together. We also have uh, the police that are providing us reports as well. So I kind of take all of that information and, uh, and track that on an ongoing basis. So what we've seen is with this, with this past year of tracking, uh, we've seen a noticeable increase in the number of overdoses in the community. And I will just note that, um, we were, this hasn't been tracked in the past. So that, that is a contributing factor, but uh, within the reports of the other drug strategy committee, we have a surveillance group as well. They have also reported increased number of overdoses within the community as well. Um, and what, some trends that we're noticing is that during the end, the end of a month or on the weekend, we notice an increase in overdoses. So this is kind of what led to some strategic, strategic naloxone pop-ups uh, because through the various months of tracking, we notice towards the end of the month, we start seeing increase in overdoses as well as long weekends. So those are some trends. Thanks for that, uh, Sarah and Eve. And I see subsequent from Wendy and then I'll go to Audrey. So subsequent, Wendy. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. What I'm looking for is more of that, that bigger ticket, those, those targets. You know, what's going on around us in surrounding communities? Is there an increase? You know, do we have any type of a track record pre-COVID, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four COVID in terms of the waves? Are we seeing a 10% increase in cases, whether it be weekend or weekday or, or what have you? Is it a 50% increase? What are those drivers so that we can build that business case. So if you need more support with the strategy within mental health, that we've got that to drive that forward, whether it's anecdotal or otherwise, is there a way that we can get that moving forward? And then going back to, let's look at the numbers in terms of who do you have working in mental health? Do you have enough people? Do you have the, um, the salaries to be able to pay? So what can we do politically based on that picture? I can um, speak to some of that as well. And I'm, I'm sure Brody has some things to add also. Um, across the mental wellness continuum, all of the teams, uh, absolutely we do not have enough people um, to deliver services to our community. Prior to the pandemic, we knew that if um, majority of our community members stood up and said, I need mental health and addiction support today, we would not be able to provide service to them. So we have been trying to work with our funders to talk about increasing 
um, funding to get more workers for both from a mental health and addictions perspective. But the, the difficulty also is that um, a worker shortage in every area across everywhere. Um, so it is very difficult to recruit. Um, I think I'm sure Brody would have some things to say in regards to salaries and uh, lack of salary, appropriate salary dollars that are contributing to that. Um, we also recognize that we have staff with very high caseloads. Um, so they are in some instances skimming the surface uh, in regards to client issues, not able to contribute as much time as they should um, to uh, sustain, a, if they were able to sustain a smaller caseload. Um, so in terms of political advocacy, funding will help, but we also need actual workers, um, community members that are interested in taking, um, taking up this area, I guess, and being a support to their community. Um, it, it is a huge challenge. I, Brody, I don't know if you have anything that you wanna to add to that. Yeah, I can add a couple of things. Um, so as far as the trends go, um, I don't have an exact percentage, but I know our monthly intakes, our, our new clients that want to come in has pretty much doubled since COVID began. We used to get about 15 to 20, maybe 25 referrals a month. Uh, right now we're looking at about 40, 45 a month that we're getting. So before we didn't have a, a wait list at all before COVID. Now we have a wait list sitting around 90 as of last week. And that's due to a few things, obviously the increase in intakes. Um, like Crystal said, our case loads are very high. Um, definitely worker fatigue and burnout is a big concern right now. Um, we Health has done excellent with offering uh, different events, wellness events, self-care, check-in type things for the staff, but it, it's becoming a lot. Um, adding to what Sherry Lynn asked earlier about um, the psychiatrist piece. Um, our Kathy McDonald or Dr. McDonald in our office right now, her and I both agree that that might not be exactly what we need. What we need is social workers um, that can do long-term counseling with our people. Um, that's more of the need that her and I agreed that would help um, diminish the case or the, sorry, the waiting list quite a bit. So those mental wellness workers that are posted right now, there's two of them, um, are more of a social worker type position. So we'll be adding two of them to the team. Um, we're short on addictions counselor right now. That's um, getting interviewed. And we also have a family educator that is gonna be hired that will be um, kind of looking after the high risk people on the waiting list while they wait, doing um, brief counseling with them while they're waiting, those higher risk people that need to wait. So we are trying to fill those gaps right now. From a, like, uh, a higher level, I mean, permanent funding is obviously something. It's hard to attract um, good workers with contracts, um, especially nurses. I've had a hell of a time recruiting nurses over the past three years. Um, luckily, we did. Um, one good thing about COVID has been nurses from outside the community have came in to help us with COVID. And I ended up snagging a few of them to come work in our area. Um, during that so thankful for that but um, I don't know if you guys know the nurses wages that they're expecting especially ones that have a specialization in mental health um, it's very high wages we're talking like six figures for a lot of them and we just can't compete with that wage right now so wage isn't also an issue um, space is an issue um, I have a 34 staff in like a seven office seven offices in my my hallway. It's not the most ideal space right now, but um, I know some of the counselors have actually physically come and seen the space. Um, while I have you guys here too, I'm just going to put it in your brain. Um, sidewalks coming into the community. A lot of our people don't have transportation and sidewalks coming into the village to get services so people can safely ride a bike on it or walk um, without fear of getting hit by a car. Um, is something big I think we need. We did um, build a computer bank. That was a result of 
um, internet being an issue. So with COVID, everything was going online, all the appointments, everything. And we all know internet access is an issue. So we did build the computer bank and it's been ready to go for eight weeks, I'd say. We're literally just waiting for hydro to come and hook up the hydro. So it's delays like that where I, uh, my hands are tied. I can't, can't do anything. I'm just kind of at the mercy of hydro, but our people, that's a service. I think um, people, you know, really need is that computer access too. So those are just some of the things um, from, from your level that I think would help public transportation is always an issue too. I don't know if, you know, we, we brainstormed uh, last week about having a short little bus system for people to come in and out of the village. I don't know how far away we are from that, but things like that would um, definitely help. Thanks. Thanks, Brody and, and Crystal for those responses. And I think um, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, we need to do some follow-up on this. Uh, and Wendy, did you have an idea on the follow-up? Yeah, sorry, last last comment. So thank you, Brody, for answering some of my questions about the stats and the trends. I, I mean, it's one thing to have this great plan and all the work that's gone into it. But if we don't have the, the human capital, if we don't have the staff infrastructure, then we're setting ourselves up for, for failure to the community. I mean, there's great work going on, but we have to have them mirror each other so that we've got the, the ultimate success moving forward. So from, I mean, we have a, a very competent SAO that can look after the administrative portion, but on the political side, building the case that you've just laid out in terms of the ratios of staff complement to the 50% increase of referrals and all of those things, that then helps us take, take it forward. So maybe that's the second piece of this or additional that we need to obtain is what is that case? What does that look like? So we can take it forward and start to, to press forward of why we need more. Um, we need those numbers and we need that picture laid out. So that's my suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, great suggestion. And I think we're thinking along the same lines uh, in terms of next step. So on my list, I have Audrey and then Sherry Lynn. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome everybody. It's good to see all of you tonight. Uh, my question is basically uh, to an extend on data. Like you have, Brody, you said you have a, a uh, computer bank that's being built and ready to be hooked up. So my question is for all the programs. So you're starting this and, and I, I, I assume that everybody is going to be putting in, inputting all their data from all the programs. So in six months from now, we can see what, uh, I guess the success of this, this man, the success of the programs and just be regularly kept up to date on the data. And I'd also like to take this moment to, to commend everybody Brody, great idea but it takes a team to do this and, and you're all working together and I couldn't be prouder of you. So now we're for that. And if you'd address my data question, I would appreciate it. Now. Okay, I don't see anyone jumping up and down. Oh wait, Lori, Lori. I was, I was jumping a little bit. Um, so, you know, we've learned a lot from, from our accreditation and we have um, Sarah now is our epidemiologist who's come on board. Um, that's shifted our access to our data. We're working with um, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences so that we can that we can have even better uh, access to our data. Working on um, data sharing agreements with surrounding agencies so that we are able to gather that better. And then we've brought on a quality lead um, so that we that we are. I mean, we're we're hearing. The, the, the data, we want to be data driven and that's been our aspiration and now we have some um, some of those human resources in place to bring those uh, together. So, you know, we'll be working on having dashboards so that we can actually bring that documentation. In terms of funding, um, we are now uh, preparing for our next agreement from a health services perspective uh, with First Nations Health Branch and so all of these kinds of, uh, all of this information will be incorporated into that uh, health plan uh, for the next um, few years uh, and, and making, you know, we've already started to make the case for uh, being adequately funded. You know, we go back to uh, the Berger formula and, you know, um, population cap or based funding that's capped at 3000 people. So, you know, those are political advocacy components that, that will need support as we uh, as we start 
working through uh, what that new health plan will look like. Um, and also, you know, being really creative, we have a lot of people and a lot of organizations at the table for this drug strategy and keeping our eyes open as well for, you know, funding that's coming from uh, other other directions, right? So um, we, we, we are reaching out to be able to access, um, you know, financial supports that, that might coming, be coming from ways that were, are not typical, um, but that really can help meet the needs, so. Yeah, all right, very well explained. Thank you, Audrey, and thank Nathan, you. Nathan, can I be next? Uh, actually, I have Sherry Lynn next, then yourself, Melba. So Sherry Lynn, and then Melba. Thank you. And then we'll start uh, thinking about uh, next steps and wrapping this up. Yeah, I just wanted to say with Brody, um, since he's been waiting eight weeks with Hydro, maybe you can contact Arlie Merkel or Lori Martin, who deal with Hydro um, strictly, that can help with high, um, these kind of issues to get it moving. That's all. Yep. Uh, thanks, Sherry. Um, so we've been going through events and public works that's who's in charge of kind of hooking up that hydro piece and we have emailed them several times for an update and all we keep getting back is it just hydro just takes a few months because it's an underground line or whatever and that's that's they put the application in several months ago uh right away and it's he did say it would take a few months and it has so um i don't know if those those people could get it going any quicker than them but we're just kind of, like I said, at the mercy of, of them right now, just plugging us in so we can get our computers and, and desk in there and get people going. I want to clarify too about the computer bank. It's, it's a community computer bank. It's not like just for mental health addictions clients. And it was, you know, uh, another reason we built it was to engage people and meet people that are coming in that we usually don't meet. So it's just another form of outreach um, for us hoping that, you know, people, we see, you know, you know, you see the people at the library and getting the Wi-Fi and all that. So just another group of people that we might bring in that we can build a connection with. And if they need services, then we're there to, to hook them up. Thanks for the clarification, Brody. And thanks for the question, Cherry Lynn. I'm going to go to uh, Melba. Yes, thank you all very much for all the work you're doing for the community. And I certainly have um, believed in outreach forever and ever. So I'm, I want to have a question. Are you taking advantage of people uh, who feel they would like to share their story with individuals or groups? And what I'm speaking of is cultural values related to becoming clean, which can be very unique stories. Um, I think it's a certainly a... a human tool, a human value uh, that can be associated with Haudenosaunee tradition belief system. And I'm wondering if that is done because we do have some people who have very unique stories. And I'm thinking of uh, when you mentioned uh, the end of November where people may be recruited to tell their stories. And, and uh, Wendy had mentioned, you know, what, what politically can be done. And I do believe that we could as council, I believe that we could take care of these some of these things like immediately, such as this, what I'm talking about. When community meet people come forward, and uh, I think Crystal had mentioned too, that you need community support. This is really unique community support because I'm not sure that you have a lot of stories that involved Haudenosaunee values that can be shared with individuals and groups. So I'm wondering uh, what you think of that and how honorariums could be picked up possibly by council almost immediately. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Thanks, Melba. And I see Lori uh, with her hand up. To, so I believe she's got a response. So I'll go to Lori. Yeah, I just wanted to, to appreciate um, that. Uh, those words, Melba, and, you know, it really ties into what Eve uh, talked about in terms of having living and lived experience, um, people who are involved at, in, any, in any of our services, but, you know, specifically around um, those kinds of stories and sharing them. Um, 
the 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 key will be making the connections right so as council i know you hear from community members a lot and you know being able to um you know make those connections between those community members who are ready and willing to share their stories and our team um is is going to be a really helpful step i think um in moving for in moving that initiative forward thank you thanks uh thanks laurie and um oh brody do you have support to that Yep, I just want to say that I appreciate those comments too. Um, we have in the past had a community or uh, lived experience led event. Um, we'd like to do it a lot more. I know um, Melba was at the one at the gathering place that we held and it had a really um, positive feedback from the forms that were completed, the evaluation forms. We had about four people tell their story up on stage um, that were past clients and their workers worked really hard to prep with them to do a really good presentation and it went really well. Um, we'd like to do more of them for sure. Um, yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. That That is um, on our radar for sure. Um, even in our groups that we are, our addictions groups, having a lived experience person, always a part of those as a goal. Um, and uh, of course, like you've said in the drug strategy as well, having someone or a few people from the community on that part. Can I have a follow up for that? Yeah, I think sure. even it could even go further at times, such as myself. I can tell you stories about my brothers, for example, they're not here, but it certainly interferes with their personal lives. I've seen it over and over in the years. I wouldn't hesitate to do some speaking at times and and tell the stories. And I'm sure many others would say that, too. I have stories about my relatives and uh, how they've suffered and how they've uh, uh, coped through the years in uh, raising a family, going to work. And some are have been successful, but not successful in some of the areas of their life on uh, relationships, for, for example. There's uh, a lot of stories that we could tell that would... Uh, I guess, identify with other people in the community because they are living in that situation right now and in the past too. So pick on people like myself and other people who can certainly um, have some stories to tell. As we know, we all have stories. This whole life is about stories. So we need to share them a little bit more. Thank you. Okay, thanks Melba and thanks uh, again to the entire team uh, working on this uh, important work. I'm going to go to next steps, uh, but before I do that, I see Wendy. Thanks Nathan. I'll make the recommendation, the motion that's listed there with the addition that the drug strategy team come back with a uh, a case for us that we can take forward to advocate for some of the gaps and needs that they are seeking. Excellent. Um, I was just going to go to that. Uh, Wendy okay. is moving moving that motion. Uh, sorry, Audrey, are you seconding that? Yes, please. Okay, just checking in. Um, Shirley, you got that noted. Just need a thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay, so we're going to go. It's been properly moved and seconded. Um, and uh, moving to the vote, all in favor. Is there any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, motion has passed. Um, motion to waive second reading on that. Nathan, do we, need a, do we need a second reading given that it's going to come back with additional information? with the added. Good call. Good call, Wendy. Um, yeah, I don't think we need second reading on that. So with that, again, just like to thank um, all of you um, for your contributions and, and the presentation and, and everyone for the, the dialogue today. I think it was really important. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, we really appreciated this dialogue and um, thank you so much for all the comments and really good feedback. We appreciate it. Yeah, well.
Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, Council, moving on to our next agenda item. We're looking at the adoption of the General Council Minutes of September 14th. I'll move. Moved by Michelle, seconded by Sherry Lynn. Any questions? Uh, I do. Uh, yeah, when we have live stream, um, I've had a concern for some time. Why isn't our community involved in Amber Squire's opening? I, the reason why I'm asking, I think it's, I think it's really important for the whole community to to hear and take part in the opening address and how it affects them in how we're thinking and relating to the meeting that we are about to have. So I'm asking the question, why aren't they invo involved? Why do we have it first just for council and then we go into our business? So it's community. actually Amber that has requested that it not be live streamed. Really? And and the reasons, I guess, we'll have to follow up with her. Okay, thank you. Okay. And and thanks for that, uh, uh, Melba. Just that inquiry because I I did ask once, and I, I can't remember how far back, and that's the response I got is is she requested that it not be uh, recorded. Okay, so just uh, jumping right back into the minutes, I believe they've been moved and seconded. Um, is there any uh, further amendments, questions, clarifications? Hearing and seeing none, moving to the vote. All in favor? Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, motion has passed. Uh, political updates. Um, again, this is kind of an open session in terms of the political updates. Um, I can give mine since I was, um, uh, Chief Hill was off last week. I did attend the leadership council meeting, um, basically to get an update on, on some of the work that's going on there. Um, sad to say a lot of it was deferred due to quorum. Uh, but uh, some of the topics that were discussed included the restructuring, the charter, uh, and then uh, just an update on, um, I believe it was social services. So those were discussed at Leadership Council. Uh, in addition, I did a, uh, try to attend uh, a uh, Iroquois caucus. And again, uh, lack of quorum prevented us from meeting. So <laughs> I tried to represent the chief last week, but <laughs> wasn't successful. So those were the two updates from last week. I don't know if anybody else had any updates. First call, second call, no. Okay, so we're going into scheduling. Um, the first one is a water connection strategy meeting. Uh, I believe we're looking at full council for this. Uh, and the proposed date is October 15th. And then uh, Indian Day School, I believe it was requested for another on-site um, support uh, day, uh, similar to what we've done a few, um, actually a couple of years ago now. And those ten of the dates have been identified as November 7th and 8th. Um, so looking to council to see if we can confirm those two so staff can start planning and doing follow-up. So I'll do it this way. Is there any conflict with those proposed dates? No, I just have a question. It's Melba. Yep. Yeah, do we have part of uh, uh, individuals coming down? Because the uh, gentlemen that... Uh, gave us a last presentation had mentioned that they would come back to the community. Are they going to be here to answer some of the questions? Uh, in terms there of, um, some... yeah, in terms of gallons, right? Is that, that's what you're requesting the, yes. the legal firm that was done? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm not doing the planning. I'm wondering, oh, Shirley just gave a thumbs up to that. So uh, I'm taking that as confirmation that yes, they will be down as well. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Darren, I see you got your hands up. No, I was putting my thumb up. <laughs> Sorry, Nathan. Okay. 
Okay, so I didn't hear opposition to those dates. So that again, uh, water connection strategy, um, October 15th, starting at 10, and then the Indian Day Schools on sign support, November 7th and 8th um, from 9 till 6 p.m. So those dates, uh, I didn't hear any opposition. So it looks like we'll go forward with those. Uh, in terms of the next um, two weeks, um, as you know, Orange Shirt Day is on the 30th. Um, and council will be closed. Uh, general finance um, again on the fourth and then human resources next week on the sixth. So that's kind of the schedule over the next two weeks. Just wanted to share that with those that didn't have the benefit of the agenda. And uh, our last item, I'm looking to Michelle uh, on, I believe she mentioned Bell. Thanks, Stephen. And so I received a community concern about Bell's services. She's been trying to hook up. Um, but more recently, she was advised that Bell has been banned from Six Nations. So I'm hoping that Darren or the task force can do some follow up and reach out to this individual. Because to my knowledge, I, I, I've not heard that. But again, if that's what Bell head office is saying, then uh, we need to find out what is happening. And then hopefully have a solution for her for her internet. I think all of us experienced some internet issues these last couple of days, so um, it's never ending. Yeah, I was, I was, I've been challenged, let's put it that way, for the last two days, and I'm on Bell as well. Um, Darren, I thought you had your hands up. Uh, just, just quickly, um, I, I wasn't aware either, uh, Michelle. So thanks for bringing it forward. Is this specific to internet services or other services? I actually, well, it is internet, and I. Yeah, it is internet. Can you can you send me the name? Um, sure, can. Okay. And I can follow up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Darren, for that follow up. Um, is there anyone? I just want to before we close off the community portion. Is there anyone that can give us a Coles note of what's uh, what the activities will be for September thirtieth, National Truth and Reconciliation Day, just for the benefit of the community? Darren, well, there's Shirley. Shirley's probably better equipped to do it. We're okay. just going to read the email from Katie. Um, Shirley, if you have more to add, go ahead. Okay, I'll turn it over to Shirley just to give that quick update uh, while we have the community with us. Let's... Yeah, no, Darren, go ahead. That's that's absolutely fine if you want to. The chief had just asked me to give an update. So I'm just here for any questions. If there's, I'll try do my best to answer questions, but uh, we'll let Darren go ahead and um, do uh, provide the news release. I know uh, earlier today um, from our comms department, um, just gonna put it up here, just give me one second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on, on the 30th, which is this Thursday, um, there will be a, an event at uh, Chiefswood Park beginning at 4 p.m. Uh, community members are invited to attend and place a, a luminary or traditional medicines at the display between 4 and 6 p.m. Uh, the luminaries will be provided on site. So again, that's Chiefswood Park at 4 p.m. At 6.30, uh, local survivors along with the chief will speak. That's Chief Mark. Uh, these remarks will be live streamed as well uh, on Facebook as attendance will be limited because of COVID restrictions as we're in orange. Um, uh, and that's pretty much it. You know, people will be asked to wear their masks and physical distancing and only a certain number will be allowed in at certain times. So, you know, we're, we're limited to 25 people outdoors and groups. Um, so that's part of the control for that. That's why it's being Facebook live streamed. Um, in addition, uh, there will be a candlelight vigil on the 30th. Community members are invited to pick up um, an Every Child Matters sign or flag this week. Um, they're encouraged to do that. Um, apparently, there was postcards uh, that were delivered in the mail to community members, so they can redeem, redeem those to pick up those. And they are available at the Central Admin uh, tomorrow from 8.30 to 4.30. Six Nations Public Works also tomorrow, same time, 4.30. Um, and they were available today as well uh, into this evening into night till 9 p.m. at Iroquois, Iroquois Village Plaza. So that's uh, that's pretty much it. Um, and, you know, we're, we're um, encouraging people to do a an act of, of 
awareness or you know show their displays uh, the orange flags etc at homes using the hashtag of uh, hashtag sn orange shirt day and share that in your on your media circles and and distribute that way as an act of awareness and education uh, uh, to 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 the greater public so uh, we're, we're asking that not just of staff but but if community if if, if, if they're so inclined so uh, that's pretty much it. And as always, we have uh, supports available to people as they work through this. Appreciate that, Darren. Thanks for the update. And I did get my postcard today. So um, it did, they did go out. They're on all the mailboxes. Um, so that's good. Uh, were there any questions? For sure. <laughs> okay, hearing and seeing none. Um, uh, at this time, I just want to wish the community well. Um, and uh, like Darren said, we do have uh, supports out there should you require it leading into uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day. So just a reminder to that. And wish the community a great evening, um, rest of your evening. Now we'll go looking to council to give me a motion to adjourn to in camera. No. Sure. Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. I will. Is that Michelle? I think that was Michelle. Moved yes. by Sherry Lynn, seconded by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, motion has passed. Okay, no.